Hi, and welcome to Econ 480. These videos were recorded while I taught the class over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, their questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. As a result, these videos are going to be shorter than a normal lecture and then may have unnatural transitions. But I hope you enjoy them anyway. Bye now. Uh, this is our fourth lecture of Econ 480. And today we're going to talk about endogeneity. And in particular, we're going to start talking about IB and two stage least squares. So, recap. Um, so far, we have um, talked mainly about how to interpret beta in the context of our regression. And then when, you know, the expected value of x u was zero, we discussed how to solve for beta, how to estimate beta, how to do the same for um, sub vectors. And then <clears throat> we describe the least squares or ordinary least squares estimator and describe its properties, as well as, you know, uh, how to estimate the asymptotic variance that we call a ball B. We um, discuss the three classical problems that lead to the expected value of x u not being equal to zero. In other words, three classical problems that lead x to be um, endogenous. And so today what we're going to talk about is instrumental variables, okay, as, as a way to deal with this um, problem over here of endogeneity. And these instrumental variables, or IVs for short, will lead to the IV estimator and the two-stage least squares estimator. And once we are there, we're going to talk about the properties. And again, I'm going to show that under some conditions, this estimator is going to be asymptotically normal with some asymptotic variance, and we're going to discuss how to estimate it. So that's about it. So let's get started. Um, we're going to use similar notation as before. We're going to let y, x, and u be a random vector where y and u are going to be scalars and x is going to take values in k plus 1. And then as before, x0 is going to be a constant term and the other ones are going to be uh, variables, random variables. So in the same way, beta is going to contain an intercept, beta naught, and then slope parameters beta 1 through beta k. And the model is going to be y equals x beta plus u. But as opposed to what we have been doing so far, we're now going to assume that the expected value of x u is 0. And then we said any x j such that the expected value of x j u is 0 is said to be exogenous. And any xj such that the expected value of xj u is not zero is said to be endogenous. And we're always going to normalize beta naught, which means that we're going to assume that the expected value of u is zero so that the constant term is, of course, exogenous. So we're going to bring right now something called an instrument, okay, to try to overcome the difficulty associated with this endogeneity problem. Okay, and so this is going to be another random variable that we're going to denote by z, and it's going to take values in l plus 1, where l plus 1 is going to be at least equal to k plus 1, but could be larger. And then this instrument is going to satisfy this condition of, let's call it exogeneity. So any exogenous component of x is going to be contained in Okay, and these are going to be called the included instruments. Included because they're included in this part of regression model. And then in particular, since, you know, we just said that the constant is exogenous, we're going to assume that our random vector z has a constant term. So z0 is just 1 all the time. <clears throat> we're going to assume that the expected value of z times x prime is finite. And then we're going to assume that the expected value of z, z prime, is finite and that there's no perfect collinearity in Z. So one thing that you'll notice very quickly is that now that we bring these instruments, we're going to be assuming all those conditions before that we place on the axis. Now we're going to place the same type of conditions on the Z. Okay, so notice here we have Z is exogenous. We have that they have finite second moments. We have that there's no perfect collinearity in Z. This is sort of like the same things that we had before the axis. Now we have the same type of assumptions for the instrument. But in addition to that, we're going to start bringing assumptions that are about the relationship between 
axis and the z's. For example, the first one says that we have this finite second moments in the um, time x here, random variable. So, um, putting this together, it gave us, gives us the five basic assumptions that we're going to need to do IV. The first one are, as I said, the same three that we had for regression, okay? Um, but now with the instruments. So expected value of ZU is zero. Expected value of ZZ prime is finite. There's no perfect collinearity in Z. And now we have the expected value of ZX prime is finite. Okay, as I said before, the requirement the expected value of ZU is zero. This term uh, instrument is exogeneity. And then in addition to these four, we're gonna further assume that the rank of this matrix over here, the expected value of ZX prime, is k plus one, okay? This is called instrument relevance or rank condition, okay? It's not difficult to see that a necessary condition for this five is that you have L at least equal to k, okay? And this rule tells you that you need as many instruments as uh, regressors you have. Um, and this is referred to as um, typically as the order condition, okay? This requirement over here <clears throat> and then um you know this requirement that the rank of um effective value of z x prime is k plus one you know as i wrote over here sometimes called relevance or rank condition okay so now we can write u as y minus x beta and then we have that the expected value of z u is zero so just put all that together, we get this condition over here, which shows us that this is the system of equations that beta solves. Now, as opposed to the case of least squares, now it's not so easy to just take this object over here and put it on the other side, because this may not even be um, square, okay? In particular, if we have more instruments than pressors, this is gonna be an overdetermined system of equations. Um, so we have just Think about how we're going to uh, deal with that in a second. But regardless of whether we can do that or not, what's true is that beta will solve this system of equation, which essentially exploits this condition over here. <clears throat> All clear up to here? So I'm going to use what I call here a useful lemma. Is, says the following. Suppose that there is no perfect collinearity in Z and let pi, capital pi, be such that the best linear predictor of X given Z is pi prime Z. Then expected value of Z X prime has rank K plus one if and only if pi has rank K plus one. And moreover, the matrix pi prime expected value of Z X prime is invertible. Okay, so we have two parts. Here's how I want to prove this. Um, we're going to start by um, doing this. We can write x equals y prime c plus b with expected value of z prime being equal to zero by the properties of the best linear predictor. So we can do that. So, expected value of z x prime, we can write it as expected value of z prime i. I'll be using this. There's something called rank inequality, which says that the rank of A, B is less than or equal than the minimum of the rank of A and the rank of B. So, this is something that we are going to use that is useful because then we can say, let's write here, one, the rank 
of effective value of z x prime is equal to the rank of effective value prime i this is less than or equal rank of pi by the rank quality in addition the rank of pi is equal to the rank of and i'm gonna just multiply by the identity matrix which i can re-express as the spective value of zz prime inverse spective value of zz prime i i can do this because i assume that there's no perfect collinearity and so again by the rank quality this is less than or equal the rank of value of z prime So we put these two things together and we have that the rank of spective value of z x prime is equal to the rank of pi. Okay. So then the rank of this object is going to be k plus one if and only if the rank of this object is equal to the second part um know that my prime effective value the x prime just pi prime effective value of z prime And this is a uh, full rank. This is full rank. This is invertible. So this is invertible. Okay. So, you mean that the rank of this guy is k plus 1 gives us a i for rank, gives us a well defined S linear prediction to I prime vertible. And we're going to use features as you move along. Questions? Okay. So now we can solve for beta by using the result from the previous lemma. Um, and so remember, beta solves this system of equations that we wrote over here. And so one thing we can do immediately is that we can pre-multiply both sides by pi, where pi is the best linear prediction of um, x on z. So using this, we can derive three formulas for beta that we're going to exploit later on. The first one is just simply take this expression here at the top and then take this guy on the to the other side. And so we obtain beta is equal to pi prime expected value of z x prime inverse pi prime expected value of z y. 
And then we can take this inverse because of the previous lemma that we just saw that said that this matrix is invertible. Okay. So this, you can actually sometimes, depends on how, you know, these manipulations we're going to do today is essentially rewriting sometimes the same object over and over because the rewriting gives us interpretations that um, we don't obtain if we don't rewrite. So let me just, the first one I'm going to do is just take this pi inside. Then um we're gonna see in a minute that this um is gonna <clears throat> have some nice interpretation, but in particular if L is equal to K, then um we have that pi is invertible. And then we can simplify this expression. As expected value of z prime inverse expected value of z y and this is going to lead later to the so-called IV estimator. The second case is the one where we're going to use, again, the same representation we did before, where we replace the expected value of expected value of z prime with expected value of z z prime i. That's all I'm doing. And so we have this expression over here. And so again, this is gonna lead to two pages this square version. Like I said, we're just rewriting the same object properties. And then the third one, I'm gonna replace pi for what it is, which is here at the top. And it's gonna to lead to this formula. And this is the longest one. Expected value prime value of prime inverse all inverse And we obtain this expression. And the advantage of this expression is that it doesn't involve the matrix pi. So you can express everything in terms of the moments of the random variables that we will get to observe in a second. X, Z, Y. Okay, so this will lead to the one step version of stages the squares estimator that we're going to define in a minute so putting all together we have that we can represent beta using the lemma that we just derived and then we obtain three different representations that hold generally and one that you know holds only when L is equal to K, but since this case is a case that will happen often, it's a case that we will pay particular attention and it's, it's particularly simple, which is this one over here. But um, 
Well, this one is the only one that is only valid under this condition. One, two, and three are generally valid, regardless of the dimensions of L and K, as long as always L is at least equal to K. So what I want to do before moving forward is to take a look at this rank condition that we have that says that this matrix over here has to be full rank. Okay. Or if you want, you can express that in terms of this matrix pi. Okay. And so now that we know what this matrix pi is, which is the best linear predictor of um, X on D, imagine that the case where you have the same number of uh, regressors and instruments, but that only the last regressor is endogenous. All the other ones are exogenous. Okay. So essentially Z J is going to be equal to X J for all the J's <clears throat> from zero to K plus minus one, because these are going to be the included instruments. Okay. But the last one is just going to be an endogenous regressor and another instrument. So when you look at the matrix pi, it's just going to look like this for the K minus one matrix over here is just going to be the identity because you have the same variable on the same variable. And then what you have in the last row is this, um, projection coefficients. Okay. Of, um, the, all the variables onto this, um, uh, not included instrument. And so <clears throat> you see that in order for this matrix to be full rank, what you need is this pi L here to be different than zero, right? And so, as I wrote here, the rank condition requires pi L different than zero, which means that the instrument ZL must be correlated with XK after controlling for all the other regressors that you have. That's the interpretation that we have, if we just, we use the results that we had from the previous um, lectures on interpreting each of these uh, coefficients individually, okay? so. That's, you know, when, if you're in a case like this, where you have one endogenous variable and you have a bunch of other controls, okay, what you want is that your instrument really predicts the endogenous variable after you account for the controls that you are. So as we did in the least squares case, we can partition beta into endogenous components and exogenous components. Before, when we were talking about least squares, that were partitioning were kind of like, um, arbitrary or were related to something that we um, care about. Uh, now we have a reason to partition the X's, okay? Because now that we have this distinction between exogenous and endogenous X's, we can um, use that in our partitioning. In particular, then we're going to divide X into X1 and X2, where X2 is just going to be exogenous, okay? So the only part of X that is going to be endogenous are going to be collapsed in all this group that I'm calling X1. We can do the same for Z. So we're going to have Z1 and Z2. And notice that by construction, Z2 just going to be equal to X, okay? Because those are the included instruments. And Z1 are going to be excluded instruments. So um, going back here, uh, we're going to do this partition. Again, X2 is exogenous. X1 is endogenous. And what we're going to do is do a best linear prediction of these variables on Z2. Remember, Z2 are the included instruments. And so when you do the best linear prediction, you get best linear prediction here, best linear prediction here, and you just get X2 here because Z2 and X2 are the same. And then we're going to take the difference, this minus this, and then we define these star variables. <clears throat> and then we have this moment over here, okay, which is pre-multiplied by Z1 which are the excluded instruments. And then you have the spectral value of Z1, Y star, equals the spectral value of Z1, X star prime, beta one, plus Z1, U, which is of course zero, because we are assuming that the instruments are exogenous. And so it follows now that in this case, we can just um, have um, this representation of beta one. And again, I'm assuming here for simplicity that K is equal to L, but you can derive a similar expression if that's not the case. And all this is saying is that if you're in a situation where you have a lot of controls that are exogenous, okay, random variables that are exogenous, uh, you can always first project them, get rid of them, and then you do IV on that, which is what this is saying. Project and then do IV.
questions. Got some questions already, but perhaps there are more. Okay. So now we're going to talk about estimation. Um, the first estimator that we're going to discuss is the one that arises in the special case where k is equal to l, which is often referred to as the just identified case. And we're going to note, as usual, by p, the marginal distribution of the variables we get to observe, which in this case are y, x, and z. And then we're going to assume that we have a random sample from this distribution p. <clears throat> and again, by analogy, our beta is the spectral value of z, x prime, inverse spectral value of z, y. So again, the estimator that arises just by replacing expectation with sample averages, which we're going to call beta hat, is 1 over n the sum of z x prime inverse, 1 over n sum z y. And this is called the IV estimator of beta. Okay, And notice that if you just, um, as we did the case for least squares, this estimator is essentially solving this first order condition. Okay, And as a result, it says that the instruments are orthogonal to the residuals from this regression. Before we had the similar result for the case of exogeneity, and in that case, x was by construction orthogonal to the residuals. Now we have that the instruments by construction are orthogonal to the residuals. And um, that's about that. <clears throat> so one thing that is useful in the scalar case um, is that the least squares estimator has, sorry, the IV estimator has an interpretation that sometimes um, is useful. And so let me focus on the case where there's a constant and there's a scalar random variable x1, okay? And so as I wrote here, one interesting interpretation of the IV estimator beta1, this low parameter, is obtained by multiplying and dividing by the sample variance of the instrument z1. And so if you just um, ignore uh, this part over here, right? What you have here is the formula of the IV estimator. But if you now pre-multiply and, sorry, divide and the numerator and denominator by this expression, you get this thing over here. And so if you just interpret this, what we have is that this is the following. Uh, on top, we have slope from a regression of y on z. And in the denominator, we have a slope from a regression of x on z. Okay? So if you let me write y equals beta naught plus beta 1 plus x1 plus u, okay? And then you also write x equals i0 plus pi 1, 1, this z1 plus, let's say, b. Then we can write um, y equals beta naught plus beta 1 pi 0 pi 1 1 plus b plus u. And rearranging terms, this is beta naught plus beta 1 0 plus beta 1 by 1 plus u plus beta 1. So we can denote, as we did before, this beta 0 star. Whoops, forgot the z. This would be beta 1 star all these u star. So note
that um the the slope of the reduced form is beta one by one and the slope of the first stage is by one. So if you do beta one pi one divided by pi one, you recover beta. And this is essentially what the IV estimator is doing. If you just look at this expression, because at the top we have this low parameter from a regression of y on z, which is called a reduced form. And so if we just look at this equation over here, that will give us beta one times pi one. And then at the bottom, we have this slope from a regression of x on z, which is the first stage, and that will give us pi one. So we're essentially doing this ratio, which recovers beta one. So this, of course, manipulation only works in this case where we have a scalar x, okay? But, um, it, it, you know, it gives a nice interpretation of what IV is actually doing. So, the IV estimator, um, So um, the IV estimator can be expressed using matrix notation. And so if you just let bold Z be the matrix that is dimension N times L plus one, X be the matrix that is dimension N times K plus one, and bold Y be the vector of dimension N, then the IV estimator has this simple interpretation, the simple representation, which is Z prime X inverse Z prime Y. So just look at it. It's exactly like the least squares estimator, except that instead of using an X here, you just have a, a Z replacing the X in uh, both of these places. Okay. But as I said earlier in class, we're not going to be using matrix notation that often. Uh, it's just that sometimes um, it's convenient, um, including cases if you're just coding some of these things where uh, expressions like this are particularly good. All right. So now we're going to move and talk about the two-stage least squares estimator. And this is the estimator that works generically for the case where L is greater than K. Of course, it works if L is um, equal to K, which is just going to collapse to the one that we just described. Anyway, so um, in this case, the expression we derived for beta um, was one of them, at least, was this one over here. Beta is expected value of pi, expected value of z x prime, inverse pi, expected value of z y. And then this expression involves this matrix pi, which is the best linear predictor of x on to z. And we know how to estimate matrices like this because that is the case of just OLS, because this is the second interpretation that we gave to least squares, which is a projection interpretation. And in that case, you know, we don't need uh, further assumptions to the ones that we already have. So again, since uh, this is the expression of this matrix, the natural estimator is just going to be this one over here, where you replace the expectations with sample averages. Okay, so pi hat n is just going to be one over n, the sum of z, z prime inverse, times one over n, the sum of z x prime. Now that we have an estimator for this pi, then we can obtain an estimator for this parameter beta over here that involves expectations that we know how to estimate and pi that by now we already know how to estimate. So that will lead to, um, <clears throat> again, three representations of these two stage least squares estimator that are essentially the one-to-one -one analog of the ones that we described in the population version. So let's start with this. First one is just gonna be the plugin of the expression 
in um, the previous slide. It's just going to be um, by hat n prime 1 over n sum from 1 to n di xi prime inverse times by hat n 1 over n the sum from 1 to n di yi Um, and I'm going to, again, rewrite this. Have, uh, I'm going to write it here. Just, just, I'm going to plug in this pi matrix inside. So that's the only thing I'm going to do. It's going to be 1 over n um, from 1 to n of pi hat prime di prime inverse. 1 over n sum from 1 to n y hat prime di e yi. <coughs> then we're going to do our second expression. And this one is going to be y hat n prime 1 over n sum from 1 to n, the di prime, i hat n, embers, same object, so we can again rewrite this as 1 over n um, from 1 to n <clears throat> by hat n prime di di i hat n inverse 1 over n um, 1 to n of pi hat n prime di y and before you ask i'm going to say here here we used um that one over n sum of zi xi prime equals one over n um, um, di, di prime, by hat, okay, by essentially this representation here we have at the top. So now we can write our third expression. And this is the long one. It's going to be um, 1 over n sum from 1 to n di xi prime inverse 1 over n sum from 1 to n zi zi prime inverse 1 over n. di xi prime, all that embers. Now we have the last pieces, this one over n, um, i xi prime. Hmm. One over n, um, one to n. Oh my God, I'm, I'm done. Uh, 
So here, say. Here, my hat. So here's an interpretation that is useful. I'm going to write it here in red. Say let x hat i be phi hat n prime i. Yeah. Okay. If we just look at the first representation that we did, we have x hat i here. We have x i i here. Here we have x hat i. Here we have x hat i prime. And here we have x hat y. And so if you look at the first derivation or representation of the two stage least squares estimator that we just derived, it's essentially saying this is the IV estimator where you're using x hat as instruments. Okay, so you have more instruments than um than regressors, right? So what you do then is you just take a linear combination of the instruments that you have and you obtain a uh, quote unquote, a new instrument, which is gonna be here X hat in my notation. And so the first expression says, look, two stage least square is just the same thing as the IV estimator that we described before. It's exactly the same expression, but instead of using Z because you have too many, you just use this linear combination of them, which are what I'm calling here X hat. So this is IB with X hat as instrument. Second expression is telling you, well, this is the same as doing least squares of Y on this new instrument or least linear combination of instruments. If you'll just look at this expression, this is exactly the expression of least squares of Y on X hat. And as I said, the third expression um, is the most annoying one in terms to, of writing but it is the one that only depends on the moments of X, Y, and Z. It doesn't involve any pies or projections. So this is sometimes called the way to represent two stage least squares in, in one step. It's called two stage least squares because as, as we will discuss in a minute, as we saw before already in the representation that we did, you can think about this in two stages, but the third uh, expression that we have over here says that even though you can think about the estimator in two stages, you can always implement the estimator in one step by using a formula like this one, okay? So three um, different interpretations of exactly the same um, expression in a way, or the same estimator. So any questions about these manipulations? All right. So notice that beta hat here solves this system of equations where it's essentially the one that we had before for IB, but now instead of using Z, we have this, uh, what we call in the previous slide here, X hat I, right? So if you just look at this, then what you have is this condition over here that says that X hat Y is, um, X hat I, sorry is orthogonal to the residuals, okay? Or if you just look at this expression over here, it tells you that U hat is orthogonal to all the instruments equal to an exogenous regressor, but may not be orthogonal to the other regressors, okay? Because again, you're taking a linear combination. So if you have 10 instruments and you have two endogenous variables and you're taking a linear combination that gives you a two-dimensional object, then U hat is gonna be orthogonal to that two-dimensional object but it may not be orthogonal to this 10 instruments in isolation, okay? And as I wrote before, it is termed two stage least squares because you may obtain this in two stages as follows. First, you're gonna regress each component of X on Z to obtain this X hat that I said before, okay? And then once you have X hat, you can regress X 
on x hat to y sorry on x hat to obtain beta hat okay and this is the second sort of like version of the estimator that i presented before which is the least square interpretation version however what's important and if you're ever coding these as opposed to using a pre-can package or formula is that in order to obtain proper standard errors you know you know, it is recommended that you do this in one step, like in the formula that I said before, or that you're careful because if you do things in two steps and you get residuals from this second step only, you're not gonna have uh, the right residuals, okay? I'm gonna explain this in a couple of slides when we get there. As before, and as it is the case with the IV estimator and the least squares estimators, you can express to stage least squares estimator using matrix notation, D, X, Y, exactly as before. And now we have this matrix X hat, which is just the N times K plus one dimensional matrix of the X hats, which are the projections, okay, that we uh, previously defined here, PZ is the projection matrix that we also defined before. And if you use this notation, then notice that we can write the three representations that we wrote using sums with matrices. The first one, it just says, this is IV where you use X hat as the instrument. First here. Second one, you say, well, this is least squares where you just least squares of Y on this X hat, okay? The third one says, you can do this in one step just by using moments of X, Z, Y. And so it's exactly the same that we did before, but with matrix notation. Questions. So that didn't spark smiles, but I thought it was going to spark some. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about properties of two stage least squares. So, same notation as before. We have y, x, u as always, and then have the same partitioning with um, the um, constant term and so on. By now, we have a number of assumptions that we uh, understand to be the basics of the IV setting, which are expected value of CU is zero, the expected value of ZX prime is finite, expected value of ZZ prime is finite, there's no perfect collinearity in Z, which gives us in turn that this guy is invertible, and that the rank of expected value of ZX prime is K plus one, which gives us this matrix pi that we had before was um, also rank K plus one and um, <coughs> invertible in the case that k is equal to l. So we're gonna obtain a random sample from the distribution of y, x, z. And under these assumptions, the two stage least squares is consistent for beta. And under the additional requirement that the variance of z, u is finite, it is asymptotically normal with limit invariance equal to this expression over here, which looks really bad, but it's not as bad and more, more than anything, um, it is a sandwich, okay? So we have, again, the bread here, meat, and the bread. Um, and so we're just gonna now prove these two properties. They're like really straightforward, given your knowledge on things. Uh, so first, um, two stage least squares is consistent, which says that beta hat converges improperly to beta as n goes to infinity. Here, for simplicity, I already wrote the expression of beta hat. One of them, you can use any of them, okay? But then uh, we're going to put things together. The first one is that pi hat n converges in probability to pi by our results on these squares, okay? Just go back to... Uh, First lecture, we proved that least squares was consistent under uh, three main assumptions. We have those three main assumptions here when it comes to the regression of x on z. And so this pi hat is consistent. Second, by the weak law of large numbers, we have that 1 over n um, from 1 to n of zi xi converses in probability the expected value of zx prime which we assume to be finite so we can do this <clears throat> and then finally
we have that one over n the sum from one to n dy versus the probability to the expected value of dy which is also finite by the same assumption same argument that we did before so by the continuous mapping theorem we have that beta hat n versus the probability beta as the sample size increases. So notice that it is just the same proof we did, or exactly the same argument we did for least squares, except that now we have to include this phi hat convergence over here, which in turn is also the same argument we did for least squares. So put all this together and we have that the two stage least squares estimator is consistent for beta. Asymptotic normality um, is we need to prove this statement where B was that expression that we had before. We added this assumption that the variance of ZU is finite. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite our estimator like this, square root n, beta hat n minus beta is going to be um, i hat n prime. 1 over n um, from 1 to n di x sine prime inverse um, i hat n prime times 1 over square root n um, from 1 to n di ui and here again we can split the argument in three the first one first one is that pi hat n versus in probability to pi by properties of least squares Second one is that um, one over n sum from one to n di x i prime present probability to the expected value of z x prime by the weak law of large numbers. The third one is one over square root n sum from one to n of di e ui conversion and distribution to a normal with mean zero and variance du by the central limit theorem central limit theorem so by continuous mapping theorem, the result follows with this B over here, which is going to be I prime effective value of C X prime inverse by prime variance of cu i the prime spectral value of c prime so again leaving aside the first step where we use this conversion of phi the other ones are exactly the same ones as we did for least squares. Just use central limit theorem. And central limit theorem, the reason why we 
include this assumption of the finite variance so that we can invoke that. And then we have the weak law of large numbers. And then you put it together with the continuous mapping theorem. Okay. So now we have what I call a natural estimator of B is this expression here that I'm so glad that I don't have to write. When I do it on the board, I have to write it. So, but now it's just written once forever. And it's B hat, look at it, as pi hat prime times one over n sum of ZZ prime, pi hat inverse. And then this is the bread. And then you have pi hat one over n sum of ZZ prime U hat square pi hat times the bread one more time. So this is the meat, this is the bread, this is the bread. Um, the important thing is that this estimator uses u hat. u hat is y minus x prime beta hat. So, as we said before, the primary difficulty in establishing consistency of this estimator is in showing this part. You can see that because we already know that pi, pi hat is consistent for pi. We already know where this is going. Expected value of ZZ prime, pi again, pi again, pi, pi, same average, pi again. So we know all the objects in this expression except for this one, okay? And this is the one that I said we are gonna prove in the second part of this class, uh, because it requires some delicate steps that will take us uh, some time. But of course, the, the difficulty here is that we, you know, we don't observe the true error term. We have to use a residual. Okay, so we have a hat here. If we didn't have a hat, and this was a u, this would follow immediately from the weak law of large numbers. But then it doesn't happen because we have um, the the u hat. But we're going to prove that this, in the case of least squares, in the second um, class second part of the class and so from now this result will follow immediately and as i said before it is important to note that um these residuals that i wrote are not the same as um y minus y minus x hat beta, beta hat okay so if you just run a regression of y on x hat in the two stages versions of least squares, you just get residuals automatically from the second regression. The residuals from the second stage are going to be this one's over here, y minus x hat beta hat. But that's not what you need. What you need is y minus x beta hat. Okay, and that's you know here goes back to the comment that I said that if you're running two stage least squares in two stages, or as I wrote here in two repeated applications of least squares. Um, you have to be careful that you're not defining the residuals uh, this way. Um, and uh, as I said, this comment is mostly relevant whenever you're just using can packages to do a regression, like in Stata or R or whatever it is that you use, where you know just call IV rag and is this will be contemplated in the coding. But it is important if you are coding your own stuff because you're having a more um, for whatever reason you're coding your own uh, code. And so in that case, you want to be careful to uh, pay attention to these things if you implement to um, applications of least squares. Okay. Questions? <laughs>